Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. <coughs> no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Lord, I pray that these words will just bring life in our hearts, that as we bring to you our worries and anxieties and fears about ourselves and about the world, that we know that you are the creator of the universe. You hold all things in your hands. And you want us to cry out for you, to you, Lord, to cry out to you to bring your power and goodness upon the earth, Lord. And in our own little ways, Lord, we ask that you will show us what we can do. Sometimes it's, time, it's a time for receiving, for telling others our problems and anxieties and being prayed for by them. But for other times, it's for us to be living out your word in whatever way, Lord. So we ask that you will show us what you need us to do and make us courageous and brave to reach out to other people in different ways. Amen. Amen. Wow. A huge thank you my friends, for having me here with you this morning. It is a, a joy, a pleasure, a privilege to be here. It was a delight to hear your praises raising up to the Lord, such sweet, sweet music. And uh, thank you, sister, for your prayers and for that reminder and encouragement about the power and the importance and the unity of the body of Christ all around our world. And that is so much of what I want to speak to you about today. Just before uh, I jump into the reading, I'll uh, give myself a quick introduction. My name's Edward Foster. I'm a, a medical doctor. I work in the accident and emergency department in a part of London called Woolwich. What that means is I often uh, say to my friends, if you're in the Woolwich area and you're starting to feel a little bit unwell, just try and make it as far as Lewisham and then you can be sure that you won't have me as your doctor in the emergency department. I sometimes have a patient say to me, oh, what, what was your name? And I say, oh, well, actually, my name is, uh, it's very easy to remember because uh, there's a story written after me. They say, a story written after you? What's that? I say, yeah, well, my name's Edward Foster. And once upon a time, there was a certain Dr. Foster who uh, went to Gloucester in a shallow brain, stepped in a puddle, went up to his middle, then went there again. And I say, yeah, uh, well, I've long since realised that I'm never going to live up to my childhood dream of uh, becoming a legend. But at least I can say that I'll, I'll be a nurse for your life. <laughs> I'm going to speak to you a bit about um, what I spend most of my time doing. I've got two shifts in the emergency department a week, and that really is in a tent making capacity, so I can do the ministry work which God has called me to free of charge. And I'm going to talk to you about that in just a moment. But first of all, I'm going to read the passage. And uh, we're reading from uh, Mark chapter 5, we'll start at uh, verse 18. The, the scene that I'll set, Jesus has just been uh, amongst the tombs and he has cast out a legion of demons from, uh, from one man. And we'll, we'll, we'll read what happens next. Verse 18 begins, As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Amen. So the man went away and began telling the, the, the Catholics 
how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. When Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman who was there who had been subject to beating for 12 years, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his coat because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crying against him, his disciples asked. And yet he didn't ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go and peace and be free from your suffering. When Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The little child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. Friends, in this story, we see the utmost importance of Jesus Christ in our lives. We see what happens when people meet this Jesus. This woman, all her life, for many, many years, had been afflicted by this bleeding, going, looking for solutions, spending all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Is that not our world? Is that not the problems we find ourselves in, doing everything in our power to fix them, yet they don't get better, they get worse. If this woman, what does she do? do? All she does is reach out and touch the Lord. And immediately she was healed. Christ says to you, her daughter, your faith has healed you. That is the power of Christ to bring healing in our lives. So much more than that. Look at what he says to Jairus. Jairus has had, heard the most terrible words I can imagine anyone can ever hear. Why bother the teacher anymore? You're too late. You've failed. Your daughter is dead. Yet despite that, Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. Amongst all the fear, all the chaos, all the turmoil of our lives, Jesus says, do not fear, only believe, for I am here, one who is greater than all the problems you face, one who is bigger than all the fears that surround you, the one who can overcome death itself, that last and greatest of enemies, is here. The one who can say that the little child is not dead, but... Thanks to this man, even death itself is now nothing more than sleep. And I just want to draw your attention to the final response to Christ we see here. Right at the beginning of this passage, what does Jesus say to the demoniac, the man who's been healed of a legion of demons? Jesus says to him, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Mercy on you. 
That really is why I am here today. For this duty that God has given us to share the good news of this Jesus to our world. Friends, it is my conviction that there is no treasure on this planet that could compare to knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. Whatever opportunities there are, whatever privileges there are, whatever riches and wealth there are, they all pale in comparison to the one detail of have you had the chance to meet with this Lord and to experience His mercy in your life? This is what splits our world in two. And I believe this is the, uh, the great task in front of us. I wonder if we might just be able to have some of the, uh, the pictures, the, uh, the slides on the screen. There's an organisation called the, the Joshua Project that does research into unreached people groups. And what they found is that if you look at the, un the number of unreached people in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that is South Asia, the Indian subcontinent, there are more unreached people in this one region than in the rest of the world combined. You got a slide for this, I think? Here we go. I believe that India is the outstanding need of our time more unreached people in this one region than in the rest of the world combined. And how can people hear about Jesus unless there are a community of Christians that can share him with them? That's my conviction. How can we hear unless there's a church the body of Christ present to share him? If you look at India, there are as many as 600,000 villages Half a million of these villages, 500,000 villages, have got no Christian presence in them at all. So that is the need for every person in this great nation to have access to the good news of Jesus. 500,000 churches is the requirement. And that is the name of the charity, the world, which I'm going to be speaking to you about today. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we just call it 500k for short. 500,000 churches, that is a need. It seems like an impossible thing. How can that be done? 500,000 churches. But I'm going to tell you how, not only how it can be done, but how God is already doing it. And I'm going to bring you on that journey uh, this morning. My, uh, my, my love affair with missionary work begun at a very young age. I grew up uh, in Cambridge, just down the road, and uh, every night mum and dad would get us four children together, and then we'd pray together, read the Bible together, and they'd read to us um, uh, missionary stories. And uh, these stories just captured my imagination like anything else. They were adventure stories that really happened. My mind-blowing experience in childhood was one of boredom. School was boring, being at home was boring. But every night, I heard about adventures, and not made up ones, ones that really happened. I, um, I don't unfortunately have a picture of a story time to show you, but I do have a, the next next thing, which have a photograph. Here is his bath time. That was the immediately preceded story time. I'd like to just draw attention to, to one of these stories which we heard. Um, uh, a particular missionary. Can we have the next photo? Anyone recognise this man? Hudson. Hudson Taylor. This man, you want to hear about adventure, read about this guy. He literally got on a boat for five months to travel around the other side of the world. He arrives in China, there's a civil war going on. Absolute chaos. This man suffers there. Some of his own family members die when he's in China. He realised that this man had something worth dying for. But not only something worth dying for, he had discovered the secret of truly living as well. Something worth living for. You read his journals, you read his encounter with the risen Lord, and you, I realise this is the kind of life that I want to live. So I'm 
grew up thinking, I'm going to be a missionary myself. That was why I enrolled in medicine. That's what Hudson Taylor did, he was a medical missionary. I thought I would do the same. And uh, 12 years ago, uh, I was in a little church just in Carson, again down the road, and uh, I heard an Indian guy speaking of what God was doing in India. I believe you've met him yourselves, a guy called uh, Das Dhanam. And the story that he told me of what God was doing in India sounded just like the stories I've had read to me growing up. Stories like that of Hudson Taylor. People risking everything, leaving their lives behind, and going to territories and communities and villages that have never heard about Jesus and seeing great breakthroughs happen. So when he said, does anybody want to come and see it? I said, well, I've spent my whole life wanting to learn from these missionaries. I thought they were locked away in the past. Just saying I can still meet them today in Cadmian. A few months later, I was traveling around India, and my life direction was completely changed. I'm going to just uh, share a, a couple of these, these stories which impacted and transformed me. I want to share them with you. With the next picture. Here he is, this is the who you met, and, and the next. This man uh, here, this is a guy called Pradi, and uh, he had a passion to take the gospel to uh, the northern regions right on the border with Pakistan. And you can see it even written there on the photo, the background is Pakistan. He's sharing the gospel to these tribes people. And it's an Islamic area, you have to be careful with sharing the gospel. It's a helpful movie, culturally sensitive. What they do is they wait until it was Christmas time. And they invite all the dignitaries around for a party. And they said, We're Christians, this is what we do at Christmas time, we celebrate. And uh, all the people come to this party, the, the, the chieftains, the local police inspector, the ticket inspector on the train, they all come. And they do two things they give the people uh, a present. And they have a slice of cake, because this is what we did at Christmas time. The present which they were at was a Bible. And uh, they're eating the cake, and they said, just as this cake is sweet, we want you to remember that when life is bitter, Jesus can be the sweet. And you can learn about Jesus in this Bible, which you have in front of you. Anyway, all the guests, the dignitaries, they go home. They think nothing more of it, this party. One of the guys, the local chief, and he gets the Bible and he puts it on the, the top shelf of his house, forgets about it. One morning, one evening, he starts getting this uh, terrible pain in his tummy. He calls his people together, he says, I'm in agony. You've got to take me to the hospital. But they say, boss, we can't take you to the hospital because we're living in a war zone. There's a curfew here. No cars are allowed on the road after 9 p.m. How can we take you to the hospital? You have to wait until the morning. So there's his chieftain. He's lying on the floor of his house. And uh, he's clutching his tummy in pain. And from the floor, he looks up and he sees this Bible on that top shelf where I left it. And he remembers what Pradi had said to him. When life can be bitter, Jesus is the sweet. And you can learn about him in this book. So he takes that Bible. He hugs it to his tummy and he says, Jesus, I don't know, but if you were God, come meet with me now. And he holds that Bible there, rocking himself, and he gradually falls asleep. He wakes up in the morning. His people come to him. Chief, we can take you to the hospital, let's go. He says, I don't need to go to the hospital anymore. The pain is gone. I've been healed. He, he sends a voice to go running to see Pradi. And then he brings Pradi to his village and he says, This is what happened to me last night. I prayed to Jesus. I held the Bible. God healed me. Now I know that Jesus is the healer and that Jesus is God. I want you to come live in my house. Teach me about this gospel. But one thing, don't tell the people you're here to teach me about Jesus. We're going to tell the same to everyone. That you're here to teach my children English. And you will. But when people are ready, I'm going to bring them to you and I want you to share the gospel with them so they can meet this Jesus like I have. 
and there's a gospel there's a church in that village to this day that, that was a story from a few years ago this is a story which happened only a few months ago this, uh, this, this young girl here on the left in the red dress her name is Kushbu and Kushbu uh, a, a wonderful story really in many ways she reminds me of uh, the demoniac that we, we learn about in this passage and we see this all over in here what we see God doing so often sounds just like what we can read about in the Gospels and in the Book of Acts. Kushbu is being possessed by demons, so she loses control of herself. She starts referring to herself in the third person, wailing, screaming, causing all kinds of chaos and turmoil in her family. This is what she's known for in the village. She's been taken for prayer to different um, uh, temples. No solution has been found, no help has been found. One day, this woman on the right, this missionary, she comes to this village and she wants to share the gospel. She offers to pray for Kushbu and her family, and her family say, we're desperate, we will try anything. And the missionary says, okay, we're going to fast, we're going to pray for one week. And your daughter and your whole family might meet with the Lord. They begin praying. They begin fasting. Before even that time, that one week is over, Krishna begins to hear the gospel. She hears of God's love for her. Her, the woman who has caused so much chaos and heartache and, and, and difficulty in her community, despite that God loves her. And she accepts Jesus into her life. She's healed. The, the demons are gone. And the story doesn't stop there because Kushbu, so overwhelmed is she by what Christ has done for her, she goes and starts sharing with all of her community what God has done for her. Again, it's just like the demon eye. She's sharing. And people, they want to listen to her because they've seen the change that has happened. The girl who was causing chaos, causing havoc, suddenly is talking about God loves them. And you can wash away all of their sins, all their mistakes, all of their failures. And uh, the wonderful thing is, seeing my testimony, 67 people came to faith in just a couple of months. 67 people. And uh, we've got another photo which we can show you here. Here are almost 30 of them getting ready to be baptised. This is a uh, one of our, our, our local leaders out in India on the right, uh, the Bible. And uh, uh, the next photo. Here you can see they've, uh, they've requisitioned the local <coughs> fish pond for the baptisms. I think it's such a, a beautiful uh, picture. Friends, that is what God is doing in India right now. When I talked about the need of the 500,000 churches and there being more unreached in the Indian subcontinent than the rest of the world combined, that makes me believe that India is actually medium on time. We hear these stories, we see how God's Spirit is moving. I'm convinced it is the outstanding opportunity of our time. When I went to India and I traveled around worshipping with little villages, time and time again, I kept seeing the same thing. Here I am, worshipping with a community of people. I've got nothing in common with them. We look different, we sound different, different clothes, we can't communicate a word in the same language. But I hear these people worshiping Jesus, and I know that we are part of the same family. And I saw that and thought, you know what? Five years ago, the gospel had never come to this community. And now there's a church here. And for me, I don't know about you, but for me, if I see that, I think that. It's history in the making. 2,000 years, the good news of Jesus has simply never made it. And now there's a church called with Jesus. Said, and that is happening all around India. And not only that, when I was in this country, I was able to visit some training centers where they're training the next generation of missionaries to take the gospel to Polish communities. And what I realized was most of those missionaries were from the new church plants in the previously unreached villages. I think that's pretty exciting. 
I don't know about you, but I think that's exciting because if you can go to these communities and share the gospel, not just share the gospel, but have people come to faith, not just people come to faith, have their lives transformed and see a church planted, and not just have a church planted, but raise up more leaders to continue that process, you could start a chain reaction whereby our whole nation truly can be reached for Christ. Um, at this stage, I'm still planning to be a, a medical missionary and and, and go to the world to share the good news. And I, I, I suddenly had a, a sense, I, I don't think these guys need me coming to them as a missionary. They're already doing it. And they're doing it on such a level where I just think, I just want to be a part of what you are doing. I just want to support what is happening here. And this was for me where the big change happened because I realised that these workers in India, so many of them, are, are not getting out into action because their own churches are too poor to send them. India is a poor place, the churches are looking after the poor in their own communities, they're looking after their own pastors. It's hard to send somebody out into the rich community. And I heard this and I thought, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And you're saying, it's not happening for money. I thought, first of all, that's crazy. Second of all, it was almost quite exciting, because it was like, that's something that I can really help with. That's something I can actually do. Getting my friends to come to church, that can be really difficult. Getting my friends to engage in conversations about Christ can be hard. But I can make money. I just have to turn up at a and &E. I don't even have to be particularly good. I just, I just have to be there. And when I realised that we could get these workers into action for £60 a month, that was what they need. That was when I thought, this is exciting, this is an incredible opportunity. I can be a doctor, I can earn a, rather than being a missionary myself, I can earn a good salary. I can live that basic missionary lifestyle as if I were in the mission fields and, and, and give the difference instead. And rather than being one worker, I can support 20, 30, even 50 of these indigenous people, these national missionaries. And uh, I first came to India 11, 12 years ago. It was seven years ago that we um, felt God speaking to us and to, to, to launch the work and to call it 500,000 churches. Not a statement that this is what we're going to do, but a statement that there's need in India and what we believe God is raising up all of his churches. And since then, we've just seen God doing amazing, amazing things. Um, I'm going to show you a few more pictures here. This is a group of these missionaries all coming together for a time of prayer and fellowship, interceding for the communities they're reaching. So another photo. This is uh, people reaching uh, some, some jungle tribes, people who, until, until the, the, the Christians turned up, were just fermenting their own liquor. Life expectancy was in the 40s. People came, shared the gospel. Here is whole churches of people joyfully praising God and seeing their lives turn around. Another, another photo. <laughs> India is this country of great, great rivers. People being baptized. All of this has been happening in the last seven years. During that period, seven years ago, we were supporting 30 missionaries in India when we launched 500,000 churches. By the grace of God, seven years later, we're supporting 780 of these same workers. This year, God willing, my dream is to send out 300 more. If that happens, we'd have broken through that first 1,000 barrier. Sure. The skeptics can say, well, that's only 0.2% for 500,000 need. But it's a start. It is happening. And what we're doing is just a small, small part of what God is doing across India. It is happening. Now is the time of God's salvation. Where does that leave us? I'm a. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm greatly challenged. I've got a, a friend um, who often likes to, to speak to me about a, a particular um, a, a particular passage, which uh, I think is very relevant. And uh, I'll share with you in, in just a moment. Uh, what I want to speak to you about is 
It's, it's two components of, of this mission. The first is the conviction of the need of Jesus Christ, the importance of the gospel. I uh, often have people at work say to me, oh, I need to, what's this, what's this charity work that you do? What's that about? And uh, I say, well, you know, I'm, I'm helping Indian people share the gospel in India. And they say, what? Helping Indian people share the gospel? Why don't you, why don't you do something useful? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I say to them, okay, okay, okay. We've got all of our patients, we'll keep them in the waiting room, we come in, we treat them, most of them we send back home. Sometimes they're happy with us, <laughs> very frequently they're not, especially when they've been waiting for five and a half hours. But even when they are happy, I can tell you, never once have I had one of my patients leave the hospital and say, you know what, thank you doctor, today, today I have found life in all its fullness. Maybe one day that will happen, not yet. It's not yet happened. And I say to my uh, medical friends, we doctors, we like to think we're doing something amazing. We're, we're saving lives, right? Life savers. I don't, I don't really know why we say that. Every patient I've ever treated has died or will at some point die. We like to flatter ourselves and call ourselves life savers. Really, we're just death postponers. <laughs> Putting off the inevitable. <laughs> It's just a great thing. But the, the reason why I am passionate about this good news of Jesus Christ is that I believe it truly can save somebody's life forever and ever and ever and bring life in all of its fullness in the here and now. That's my, that's my witness to Christ. I'm sure there's a building for the people who can give that same witness. So, you have this conviction that the, the, the great need is Christ, that has the conviction which is behind all these Indian workers taking the good news to unreached communities. The second strand, if you like, really, is, is, is being sacrificial, is being all in. And ultimately, that begins with Christ. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. And we know what Christ has done for us. The price he paid for us. 1 Peter chapter 2, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood that is the price that was paid for us. That is the value that we know of. The blood of Christ. And uh, Christ calls us to do the same, to have the same response. Not just to be passionate about his gospel and the need for in this world. But to be all in behind it. These Indian guys are doing it. They are there. Their lives are on the line. I'm uh, so challenged by the, 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 the parable of the, the widow's might. She doesn't have a lot, but she, what she has, she gives. And Christ commends her because out of her poverty, she put in all that she had. I believe that's what Christ is saying to us today. All of us, really, before the king, are, are as beggars and rags. But Christ says, out of your poverty, be all in. Do what you can. This, uh, this need in India, I believe these workers are depending on us. And what we can do to help, really, there's three things. Pray, preach, and provide. Pray, get on our knees, cry out for God to send out more workers into the harvest. Preach is get opportunities for the final okay message to be shared, like what I'm doing here this morning. If you know other, other churches, other people who would like to hear this message, please do throw us in touch. And, and thirdly, provide. And in many ways, I think this is the most important because, the most important because, when we give, we do the first 
verse 2 as well. You ever notice how hard it can be to pray? How hard it can be to pray for something? Very difficult. Or Christ says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we give to something, we naturally become passionate about it. We start praying, we start preaching and telling other people about it. This, um, this year, I mentioned we have this, this uh, hope to see 200 new workers released. Wow, that's a lot of people. That's, uh, that's 25 every month, 25 new missions every month. Well, it's a bit easier than that because we, we, uh, I, don't know, I don't quite know how, but we've had some very generous people offer for each month of this year to, to stand as, as match funders. So what that means is that we can find 12 and a half people to support a missionary each month. These guys will make up the difference of the other 12 and a half. Whatever's gift will be matched and doubled by this circle of match funders. So every month, basically me and the team are trying to say, can we find 12 and a half people to start supporting a missionary? And uh, my hope is that there may even be some of those people right here this morning um, in St. Andrews, Oakington. Whatever you can get can be a pretty huge difference. You can give £60 a month, that's a whole, a whole new missionary. That's gone out. If that's too much, £30 a month, a pound a day, that is still a whole new worker with the match funding. And what I just think is amazing is even somebody in our country who's on the minimum wage, £8.50 an hour, in a single day, they can earn enough for one of these workers to support for a month. That is the opportunity in front of us. Um, I've left a couple of sign-up sheets by the door. Um, please do before you leave. I'd love for you to put your name down, put your email address down. If you'd like to pray, just name, email address. You'd be on a prayer letter. Um, if you'd like to commit to giving as well, that's also an option. You can just indicate that on the paper. Um, to wrap up, I want to just share one last um, story with you. Uh, I don't know if you've got another, another a, a slide there. Um, sorry, I'll quickly explain. All these, this is basically where we're at at the moment, the map of India. All of the dots you see here are uh, different uh, missionary, and uh, the colours represent the different local leaders that are arranged underneath. And uh, the next slide. Right, this is a story I'm going to leave you with. You've got to get here. That's who you met a few years ago. This guy in the middle on the crutches, he's called Belvinda. And uh, I've met this guy, I've been to this village. In fact, I took this photograph a few years ago. I think the most incredible story. Belvinda and his brother Surinda, they, um, they had a passion to go to a place right on the Ganges River in, uh, in, in the heart of the heartlands of India, a place which is called the headquarters of Hinduism, Haridwar. And uh, this is a place where you see these enormous statues of uh, different gods. And uh, they went to this place. Um, they started uh, teaching, they, found some, they met some children on the street, started to teach them English, different skills. Before long, the parents said, oh, you're, you're helping teach our children English. That is having the best currency in India, really. Would you like to come live with us and continue teaching them? And they said, well, we, we, we would love to, frankly. So Govinda and Surinder, they, they move in, and uh, they start sharing the gospel with his family, and uh, this family comes to faith. Great, great food to me. At this point, Surinder, the younger brother, he leaves. He goes back down south to finish his training. So now Belvinda is there alone. Things are going great, as so often happens when the gospel is advancing. Difficulties start to come. People in this community began to be resistant to Belvinda. I, I remember meeting him and telling me about. He would uh, remember he, the, the local people would get drunk and then they would come across the room to a seat and they would smash the empty glass bottles against his house, trying to intimidate him, preaching, we don't want you here. Gradually, this, this harassment it increased and increased and increased to the point where people would sometimes form a circle around his house saying, when you come out, preacher, we're going to kill you. And this happened one time and the people were Persistent, they weren't leaving. And Belvinda, he calls up his brother Surinder on the phone. And he says, Surinder, this time I really think they mean it. I don't think I'm, I'm going to get out. But do one thing for me. When, when I die here, 
I want you to, to bury me here. Don't tell me about your homeless mind, Dad. I want you to bury me here. These people are my family now. The good news is that God is still with us today. He's still alive. And what happened was, that family that he lived with, a few other families that all come to faith, they left that building and they formed a circle around God in there. And they said to the townsfolk, if you want to hurt this man, you're going to have to hurt us first. And the village people gave up and went home. Friends, that is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But though there was so much darkness in this community, that the, that the response to hearing about the God of love was to want to hurt this man, hurt this God in there. Despite that, people in this community were transformed to the point where they said, if you want to hurt this man, you're going to have to hurt us first. And that is the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is the level of sacrifice that people are willing to go to our Lord and Saviour. So that'll be my question for us today. What can, what can we do to respond? Uh, as I mentioned, the, there's a sign of sheets at the back before you go. I'd love for you to put your, your name down. Um, Paul, are you? No? <laughs> okay, well, so, uh, what's next? We, we, we can pray? Or... Well, thanks so much. It's been a joy and privilege to be here.